Good morning, church. I'd normally just say good morning, but as Sherman's here today, I know he'll say good morning, church. And so, uh, yeah, I ended the lesson. Okay, as Sherman can't speak for, he can't uh, preach this morning. Uh, I should have got Achim to actually preach the lesson the way he carried on this morning, especially when I gave him those scriptures to read from Deuteronomy. I could have sworn that I'd gave him, given him the whole book to actually read the way he reacted. <clears throat> Sometimes uh, we forget how blessed we are to be living in the times that we are. If we want hot water, we can turn on a tap. We have various foodstuffs in our kitchens. We have the luxury of being able to choose from a range of different things. We have cars to drive us around. Uh, if we want a, a copy of something, we can just go to a photocopier and we can make a copy or, or we can print it out. And it's only when we don't have those things that we realize sometimes how much of an impact they have on our lives. So I'd just like to thank you, ESCOM, for reminding us. <laughs> In biblical times, the scribes were responsible for copying the manuscripts that made up the scriptures. And this meant that ensuring that every word was copied exactly as the original had it, down to a single jot or tittle. And this would be, well, the jot is the smallest letter that they had, and a tittle is a bit uh, like an accent would be, um, like a kapi on an E in Afrikaans, or an umlaut on an O in Markota, which got dropped a while ago. Um, and I think, I don't know, does anybody even use accents like that anymore? Uh, I know they don't work well on cell phones, and in fact, I think letters are also becoming optional on cell phones as well. But to be a scribe and to actually write to that sort of detail is certainly not a job that I would want. My lovely wife, Tish, says that I write like an ant, so it's probably a job you wouldn't want me to have either. Now, because the scribes were responsible for painstakingly copying every word, it's understandable that they would become experts in the law, and not necessarily what the law meant or how to interpret it, but certainly they would know what was written in the law. And so around the water cooler, or their equivalent in the time, it would be understandable if they debated what the greatest law was. And now with the benefit of Jesus' input, we know what the answer to that question is, but spare a thought for the scribes with over 600 different individual laws that they had to contend with. They must have got to the point of wondering if any are more important than others. After all, if some laws are more important than others, you certainly want to be make sure that you're following those ones and maybe you could let some of the less important ones slip a bit. I would imagine one of the ways to check how important a law is would be to look at the punishment for breaking it. For example, if letting your cattle graze in your neighbor's pasture or having a bull gore your neighbor's bull to death meant you had to pay a restitution, that would be one thing. But on the other hand, if you worshipped other gods or committed adultery, or if you cursed your parents even, that could get you stoned to death. And so those laws must be pretty important. With so many laws that the, that the Jews had, it would be understandable if you could not keep them all. And we know that we are all sinners, and only Jesus is without sin. And so when the scribe came to Jesus in uh, as is related in Mark chapter 12, verse 28, and he asks which law is the most important. It would have been with genuine interest that he listened to Jesus' answer. Mark 12, 28 says, And when one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him which commandment is the most important of them all. And Jesus answered, The most important is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And this commandment to love God was given to the Israelites as they were about to take over the promised land. It was given as part of the preamble that Moses spoke to the people as he was busy relating other laws to them as well. It carried no direct consequence for disobedience. It's after all, how do we tell if you're obeying a law like this? We'll probably need the thought police to get involved. 
But the Jews were careful to obey every law that they were given. Look, for instance, how they reacted to what they were told about how they should handle the law in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8. It says, You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorsteps of your house and on your gates. And the religious leaders of the day took these laws maybe too literally, because they would take some of the scriptures and they would put them on little boxes called phylacteries, and they would wear them on their head. And Jesus criticizes them for this practice in the book of Matthew as well. He says, they do all their deeds to be seen by others. They make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. So this is not what God meant. God wanted the Jews to always be thinking about what they did in context of their relationship with God. And the emphasis should be placed more on what he said in verse 6. He said, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And this idea of being close to God and his laws is repeated several times in the Old Testament. And Joshua also repeated them to the people as the Israelites were claiming the promised land. Joshua 22 verse 5 says, Only be care very careful to observe the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, to love the Lord your God and to work, walk in all his ways and keep his commandments and cling to him and serve him with all your heart and all your soul. And so what does it actually mean to love God with all of our heart? And this idea is probably be dem best demonstrated by David. He was, after all, described as a man after God's own heart. And I think this meant that he shared God's ideals. He was not perfect, but he had a relationship with God, and he understood his role in that relationship. He did not become arrogant or proud or corrupted, when he made mistakes and they were pointed out to him, he did not make excuses. He acknowledged his error and he accepted his punishment. For instance, after his sin with Bathsheba and after he arranged to get Uriah killed, the prophet Nathan came to David and he tells him that he can't get away with what he had done and he would be punished by God. And part of that punishment was that the son that Bathsheba bore him would die. And shortly after Nathan had spoken these words to David, sure enough, his son became sick. But look how David reacts. He, he lies on the ground all night, and he does not eat, and he pleads with God not to take his son. He lies on the ground for seven days without eating, and his servants are worried about him, so much so that when the fi a child finally dies, they whisper among themselves, saying, what do we do now? Because if we tell David, we don't know how he's going to react. But how does David react? He hears the servants whispering, and he, uh, he gets them to tell him what had happened. But his reaction then is not what the servants expect. Instead, David washes himself, and he goes to the temple, and he worships God, and then he comes home, and he eats. And his servants are baffled, and they ask him about his behavior. And he said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious, gracious to me that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. You see, David understood that he could plead with God. But ultimately, if it was God's will that something should happen, he accepted that. You see, David demonstrates to us what God requires of us through his actions. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words should be on your heart. And this is a precursor to what Jeremiah spoke about, a new law written on our hearts. But Moses did not just speak about loving God with the heart. He talks about the soul and the might and or our strength as well. The heart is the seat of the emotions, but the soul is, represents our spirit, and our might implies that we will use every bit of strength that we have in loving God. And Jesus added the mind in as well in his reply to the scribe. In other words, God, in other words, intellectually, God wants us to love him as well, not just emotionally and spiritually, but we need to use our minds as well. So the question is, do we love God with all our heart, soul, and might the way that David did? 
God wants us to love him. And if we do and follow his commandments, he tells us that he will be faithful to us. Now, the laws were written to show the Israelites how they should interact with God as well as with each other. In Psalm 119, the psalmist wrote, I love your laws. And this implies that he dwelt within them. Do we love God's word in the same way? Do we dwell within it? It is only by reading the Bible that we can really get to an understanding of God and his word. But unfortunately, it's all too easy to neglect this part of our relationship with God. Now, I don't know if there are any lawyers here today, but it's difficult for me to, concept, to, sorry, to grasp the concept of loving laws. But if we think about it, well-written laws should protect the poor and defenseless as much as they protect the rich. An example of some of those laws that were given to the Jews are, for instance, from Deuter Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 17. It says, you shall not pervert the justice due to the, to the sojourner or the fatherless or take a widow's garment in pledge. And in Leviticus 19.9, 9, it says, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And Deuteronomy 24.19 has a similar idea. It says, When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. And the reason it goes on to explain is this. It shall be for the, for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over them again. It shall be for the, for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. And when you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not strip it afterward. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. And this is why, in the book of Ruth, when Ruth had nothing, she was able to work almost side by side with the harvesters in the field, even though the field did not belong to her. You see, even the law in the Old Testament times took into account that we need to be neighborly to others, that we need to look after those who are less fortunate than us. Without the law, everyone can do what they think is best, and that is often what is best for themselves at the expense of others. In the book of Judges, the Israelites had no consistent religious leadership and they continually were fighting off the nations around them. Things would go right with them for a while, and then their leader would die, and it was almost like they forgot God, and they fell into anarchy until God appointed a new leader. And every time the writer of the book of Judges would say, in those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So, we see we cannot live without laws. As Paul says in his letter to the Romans, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. The law teaches right from wrong, and without the law, the Israelites would not have been able to discern if what they were doing met with God's favor or not. It was, it's interesting that Paul wrote this in Romans about not knowing about sin or, and right and wrong. Because when his name was still Saul, he persecuted the church. But he was acting in good faith as he thought that the law required him to do. And the problem with any law is if the interpretation of that law is wrong, the consequence can be different to what the writer of the law desired. And that is why even today laws are tested in court to see how they are actually interpreted in practice. And so there must be a better way than having laws and just following laws blindly. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus started preparing the people for a radical new take on the law and how we should relate to other people. The Israelites had been taught that they should love God but the law that they should love one another kind of got lost in amongst all the other laws. So it would not be too surprising if the Israelites did not take it too seriously. But it is there in Leviticus 19, verse 17. It says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. And you shall not take vengeance or bear grudge against the sons of your own people, 
but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The law covered relationships with each other, but laws are rigid things that, as we can see, can be twisted if you know how to do so. And so in the Beatitudes, Jesus starts to show how we should relate to each other. And these are some of the things that Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. In the same way, he says, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And he said again, but I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the fire of hell. And again he said, let what you say simply be yes or no, and anything more than that comes from evil. So we should not swear on something in order to emphasize it. And in verse 39, he says, I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And give to the one who begs from you. Do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard it that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And these were radical ideas, considering how legalistic the Jews had become and the importance that they placed on the law. But Jesus was trying to break that bond that they had with the law and show that there is, in fact, a better way. Now, we know that sometimes things can get lost in translation. We know that the Old Testament was translated from Hebrew. And when Moses told the Israelites to love God, the word that he used there can actually be understood as having affection for someone or loving like you love a good friend. And the New Testament was translated mainly from the Greek, and they have Four words for love. First of all, agape was a Christ-like, self-giving, sacrificial love. Then philea, which is the love of friendship and camaraderie. Storge is a love of affection that arises from natural attachment, such as love for a family member. And eros is the love of romance and sexual attraction. And when Jesus repeated that Old Testament passage to the scribe, the word that he used in the Greek was agape, which is the sacrificial love, a deep love that requires nothing in return. And this distinction is important because God wants a relationship with us that goes beyond the surface laws and lodges deep within our hearts. To get an idea of how Jesus expects us to love, look at the way in which Jesus forgave Peter for disowning him and the words that were used. Remember that Jesus had basically, uh, sorry, Peter had basically denied Jesus when he was about to go on the cross. And then Jesus was crucified and he rose again. And the disciples had seen him a couple of times before this had taken place. But the disciples were out one, one night fishing and they hadn't caught anything all night. And then Jesus stands on the shore in the morning, and he tells them to let out their nets on the other side of the boat. And they do this, even though at first they don't, don't recognize that it is Jesus. And they then catch so many fish that they aren't able to pull the net back into the boat. And John 21.7 tells us that that disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he, stripped, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. Typical Peter doing everything um, to the full. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but a hundred yards off. And when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring, bring some of the fish you have just caught. And so Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. So they have breakfast. And then Jesus turns to Simon Peter and says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And, so, and Peter replies, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. 
And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. But what's interesting, yeah, is what's lost in translation. Because we've only got one word for love. And the first two times, Jesus asks Peter if he agapes him. That is, does he love Jesus in that sacrificial kind of way? Will he die for Jesus? Each time, Peter replies that he phileos Jesus. In other words, he loves him like a brother would, or like a good friend would. And what we can see here is that from this, that Peter goes on an incredible spiritual journey after Jesus ascends to heaven, because he's instrumental in the start of the church, and eventually he does sacrifice himself for Jesus and his church. So how does God want us to show love for him? And the obvious answer to this would be to say, by obeying his commands. John 15 tells us, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. But the book of Romans reminds us that the law is not perfect, and that if we love our neighbor, we will naturally fulfill the law. Romans 13 says, owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, and therefore love is fulfilling of the law. The book of 1 Corinthians contains what is sometimes referred to as the love chapter, a chapter written to express how Christians should behave and demonstrate love. And it's no coincidence that it appears in Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church because they were beset with problems that came about simply because they were not demonstrating these qualities. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 3 says, For you are still of the flesh, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? The Corinthians were arguing about whose baptism was better, as some had been baptized by Paul and others by Apollos. They had people worshiping with them who were openly conducting illicit illicit relationships. They were taking each other to court. Their Lord's table was a disgrace, and those with spiritual gifts, such as speaking with tongues, regarded themselves superior to those who were not able to. So in response to this, Paul teaches them how to love one another. He writes, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but if I have not love, I gain nothing. It does not matter how blessed we are with the ability to speak eloquently. It does not matter if we have spiritual gifts. It does not matter how much we proclaim the gospel. If we have not love and can demonstrate it, we are just making a noise. It does not matter if we have studied the scriptures and have understanding of concepts that others only have just begun to struggle with. It does not matter if we have so much faith that we trust God implicitly that he will guide us in our lives. It does not matter if we do not have love, it counts for nothing. Gifts of prophecy, intelligence, and knowledge, although good in their own right, do not make you a good person. It all needs needs to be done in love. We know that in Corinthians as well, it says, all of us possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. It's possible, even, to give away all that we have by compulsion, and do that without love. What if the rich young ruler had obeyed Jesus' words and given away all that he had because he felt obliged to, because Jesus had told him to? Paul is saying, yeah, that unless he did it with love, he would gain nothing. And what of sacrificing ourselves? Even that we can do without love. After all, how many suicide bombers blow themselves up? Do they do that in order to demonstrate love? Does this mean 
that we should not be doing these things by no means. And I don't mean the suicide bomber thing. We should be doing them, but our desire must be to do them out of love. In other words, with no regrets, with no ill feeling, and with no second guessing. So Paul then goes on to describe how we should love. He says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with the truth. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we living up to these ideals? For us to demonstrate true love, we need to be patient and kind. We must not be boastful or proud or arrogant or rude. We must not be self-seeking, wanting to get our own way at the expense of others and irritable or resentful when we do not. And we should find no pleasure when people do wrong. And sometimes this can be difficult, such as when the EFF break the laws of parliament and turn it into the circus at the ANC's expense. But we should rejoice in the truth. And the truth here is God's truth, the Bible and the good news that it contains. It's not easy always to demonstrate love, but that's what we are called to do. I started this morning's lesson by looking at the greatest commandment, that we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then we looked at some of the laws that commanded the Jews to do that, and how we can do that today by loving our neighbor by ourselves. But there's one more commandment that Jesus gave. In chapter 13, in the book of John, Jesus is talking to his disciples at the Last Supper, and just before he is crucified, and he talks about how the disciples should treat each other when he is gone. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. If we are to love our neighbors, how much more then must we love one another as disciples of Christ? In the light of these words, we can understand Paul's frustration as he wrote to the Corinthian church, because they were certainly not showing love one for another. They were not demonstrating that they were different from the world. But we must. We, should be called, we, should, we are called to do that. The command for believers to love each other in the New Testament, the command for how we are to relate to each other in the body of Christ, is not merely that we bless those who curse, or that we return good for evil, or that we pray for those who treat us badly, or that we do unto others as we want them to do to us. No, there's more to this command. We are to feel an affection, a tender affection for each other. Does this mean that we should feel more affectionate and sympathetic to our brothers and sisters in Christ than we do with our own family? Maybe it does. It's not always easy to do so. But if we want to show the world that we love God and we are his disciples, the best place to start is by loving each other. And as Derek said, we have an opportunity to do so this afternoon with Janine's memorial. So I pray that we would all be here this afternoon to show that we do feel love for one another.